Okay, welcome curious minds out there to a brand new episode of Flying Chariots, The Rise. I'm delighted to have Brandon Thomas by my side once again for this episode. And at this point, I would like to mention his very own podcast, Expanding Reality, once again. You can find the link in the description. <laughs> Click on the link and show some love there, guys. So, with that said, here with us tonight is the one and only Barry Fitzgerald. Besides many other things, Barry is well, a well-known paranormal investigator and a fantastic author. And tonight, we will definitely talk about his latest book, The Deceptions of Gods and Man. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel and Brandon, for having me on. I appreciate it. You're welcome. The first question, Barry, I know it's it's a standard one, but there are likely a few people out there who aren't familiar with you, and this might be might be interesting for them, of course. So can you tell us what sparked your interest in the paranormal and how did you went from being fascinated to actively investigating supernatural phenomena? Well, I, I think there's a there's there's a huge element of my Celtic heritage in there that uh, you know keeps us uh, connected to the land and the spirits of the land. And uh, we don't have to travel too far in Ireland before you're you're introduced to that. And as a child, I grew up in a house that was that was uh, that was haunted, and that's where I got one of my first experiences. But at at the time, you know, I, I never really connected the dots. I was too young. Um, but uh, I, I, I really blame the, the path that I'm on. I'll blame it on my father because he uh, he set us down in front of the, the TV to watch Doctor Who, episodes of Doctor Who and, and, and Star Trek. And of course, that inspired me, enthused me further to ask why and how. And so I, I, I think I'll, he'll have to take the blame for some of it. Uh, but... Uh, and then leading on from that, uh, of course, my, my curiosity grew and and I've been involved in uh, the, the paranormal research now for, for over 35 years. Uh, and it has taken me all around the world. Um, and the experiences I've had, you know, I, I read about some of them in, in, in the books. And uh, but a huge majority of, of, of what I encounter is is pretty much on, on a personal level. So well, people say to me, well, why are you doing this? Well, well, I'm doing it for me. It's, it's, it's not for anyone else. It's my path. Um, so that that's, you know, they say to me, well, how do you, how do you um, address a skeptic? Well, I don't um, because that's obviously not their path. It's I'm on my path. And if people want to know about it, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. If they don't want to listen, well, then that's okay. Um, and, uh, and we roll on. Yeah. Awesome. Oh man, I'm popping into cheers, cheers, yeah. Uh, I could not agree with you more, dude. I have abandoned. I'm on the other side of this dark nonsense right now, but the the one thing I'm grateful for is the empowerment of the abandonment of sort of this out of my way, people pleasing sort of a thing, and survival sort of a deal. And so now it's just clear path to where I'm going. If you're in my path, dude, you are you get the most abundant, amazing help ever. But if you're not, there's there's sort of a stray away that I'm not offering my energy and attention to. So I could mm -hmm. I'm smelling what you're stepping in, as we say in Texas. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, Barry, let's jump right in into your uh, book, Deceptions of God and Man. Please sure. give us a brief overview of what this book is about and what was the what gave it a drive to write such a book. Um, I, I think for for the last definitely for the last ten years, I've been watching this this um, love and light um, thing expand and, and and grow, and and I could see that there was an element of this that needed addressed. There there was you know every sword has a double edge, and uh, and I wanted to to look at this other aspect um, that that uh, was clearly there but wasn't being addressed. I felt, and and. The book itself looks at at a lot of the phenomena that we're that we're interacting with, and uh, and how it is is manifesting itself, and and from our perspective, we we wanted to examine a lot of the deception. There was a high level of deception was coming through from beyond the void, um, and uh, and how we were dealing with that. And you know it's it's a strange thing, um, Daniel, that humanity seems to suffer from amnesia 
Um, and we have this very, very strange thing, especially when we've got we've got inexperienced folks who who are coming into paranormal research and and they're inexperienced, yet they're developing communications, whether it be through um, um, various different um, pieces of technology that will flash lights or, or sound a siren or, or something like that, or, or even the, the, the good old Ouija board. Um, you know, they're, they're communicating with something which is coming through and it will give them, say, two truths and four lies. And we have this ability in which we ignore the four lies and concentrate on the two truths. And that in itself is a grave mistake on our part, because if it's lied to you once, whatever this is, is going to lie to you again and again and again until it gets what it wants. And uh, so what we wanted to do with the book was to readdress this, to shift our perception back, take a step back and start asking questions like, okay, what actually are you? Where do you come from? How do you prove that? You know, we needed to put some some questions back in its court. And, and I, I felt that if we've got something that, that's coming through from this alleged space beyond the void, um, we wanted to, if it was coming through and, and, and was promoting itself as being there for our positivity, for, for our help, well, then it's not going to mind a few questions for clarity. And, and I often find time and time and time again, the moment that I start pressing it for clarity, it's gone. It will not answer the questions. That to me speaks volumes. And that added to, to, to the title, The Deceptions of Gods and Men, because not only do we have the gods coming through and lying to us, but we also had this element of deception from the human side in which things uh, encounters were being manipulated to suit a narrative and and the true essence of that encounter was being left behind and what we were doing was was ending up moving into a situation in which we were bringing people to worship this and and that in itself I, again you know, I had grave concerns, especially when we go back and we start looking at the likes of, of the, the shining ones, my nemesis, um, these beings that appeared um, usually around rock formations, either on them, in them, um, or above them, and uh, and these these beings uh, portrayed themselves as being these um, almost religious characters, um, but the true essence of of unworthiness of the encounter, we could tell within the first 20 seconds. The first 20 seconds of the encounter was vital because within it, within that encounter, you have got our own instinct. The seat of our discernment is already reacting with the body and manifesting in the body within the first 20 seconds to tell us to get the hell out of there because this thing is not as it portrays itself to be. Uh, but after after it goes past the 20 seconds, it has this innate ability to lock into our consciousness, and that becomes the trap. So by that, by that stage, we're already hooked. So by listening to the first 20 seconds, um, told us everything that we wanted to know. If your body didn't react, you're okay. If your body did react, that tells you everything you need to know about what is coming through um, and to be prepared. So, and we have we have countless examples of that. Medjugorje is another perfect example. Um, and uh, the, the fact that the three children were stunned uh, to fear, by fear, within the first 20 seconds, spoke volumes about what was actually coming through. When you've got something that's coming through and your body reacts, and it's trying to tell you, do not be afraid. No, you damn well should be afraid at that particular point. You need to understand the threat that's coming through with this. Um, so that's that's primarily what the book was designed to do. It was, it was designed to make us take a step back and think and go, okay, okay, let's look at this from a different perspective. Let's address the encounters from now on, possibly with a different perspective. Not to say don't do it. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying, if you want to get involved with it, be aware of the greater picture. 
And so that's primarily what it was about. And of course, that's leading on to the next book, which, which I'm in the middle of at the moment, staring into darkness. Brendan, you, you want to you wanna go first? Dude, yeah, oh. yeah, very. Man, uh, so very in line with what you're talking about here. What you think of that uh, term, louche, to see uh, what you think the mechanism of operation here is, meaning Dr. Monroe's term. Are you, are you familiar with that term, louche? And I'm, I'm, a, I'm aware of Dr. Monroe's work, but I'm not aware of that term. He coined the term louche in one of his books, and what it basically refers to is an energetic resource, right? Like a... Um, perhaps adrenochrome in a physical sense could be one of these physical manifestations of the type of energy we're talking about. But what it occurs on a level of is sort of a Wi-Fi between us and something. Uh, now, some people have said that this is archons. You know, the Cathars and the Gnostics talk about the Demiurge and how that we're actually in this carbon copy of a post-hell world and how it's not that great and all that stuff. So Lush would be this mechanism of operation to extract our negative energy specifically is what's most palatable, but they take anything, any mm -hmm. emotion, right? And this seems to be why everything around here inspires emotion and you get very emotionally invested. Well, that's an energy resource that something is benefiting from. Uh, and it seems also whenever people feel contacted by these things, it leads them down such elaborate um, narratives that it really feels that it, it you can watch it work in a way and it's it mm. seems to be revealing its tactics as it as it functions in others around you if you can focus on it so yes. what do you think about that just sort of that we're a product uh, for something well it's certainly from my perspective from my own work i see that fear is a huge aspect of this now there is a lot of noise out there um and we need to be aware of that even within modern ufology there is a massive amount of noise out there and the true phenomenon is lost in the middle and that's that's exactly where it wants to be and um, it wants to remain hidden as long as it can continue to operate and we do we have the same within the paranormal as, as well um not everything that goes bang in the night is a ghost and not everything that we tend to see flying through the eye through the air is a ufo but there are agendas out there which are being met at the moment, which we won't get into here. Um, but uh, fear is a definite key factor within the true phenomena in which when it, when it manifests, um, even within the sanctity of our own homes where we feel safe, where these things will penetrate through um, and do what they do, um, fear is, is, is a great asset to them. And... Interestingly, though, when we look at the manifestations of, of say, for instance, the 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 gray the gray aliens, um, and uh, and and the jinn and the fairy and and uh, and even the the incubi and uh, and all this all these particular masks that are applied over the generations, um, there is one key factor, one main key factor which binds these things together, which, which again starts to point at the same origin. Is there, is there absolute, their fear of iron? And we see this time and time again, um, nine times out of 10, when you've got the night attacks that occur, they will attack women during their monthly cycle when they become anemic. The same is also seen with, with the gray aliens. When they appear and there's iron in the vicinity, that's it. They're done. They're gone. They have a fear of this. Now, for, for an alien that's coming from, allegedly, um, um, another, another solar system, um, God knows across the Gulf of Space, why is it sharing this common factor with a djinn, with a fairy, with an incubi, with the old gods? Um, so there is a common aspect there and, and, and a relation in which we ourselves can, can defend ourselves with um, and keeping an eye on our systems, our bodily systems. And what we eat also affects how this, this true phenomenon can interact with us. Um, and you know, even from, from aspects of, of the Islamic faith, I, I, I had this uh, great pleasure to speak to um, a young lad in, in the UK, and he spoke about the need, their need to keep um, someone with their wives during pregnancy all the time, 
um, because these things will attack during pregnancy. And I was saying, but that's that's in relation to the iron. So when we sat down and we talked about it, he was saying as well, we were there was a meeting of minds across these cultures where saying we're seeing the same thing, but they never they never thought about the iron connection. Um, and uh, so, you know, it is, it is a, it's a very interesting thing to take a step back and look at the phenomenon. And a lot of the times I had to, I had to experience the phenomenon to understand it, to break it down and also look for its weaknesses. And so I did experience a lot of things out in the field. Um, not so much now. Um, I'm getting old now. And, uh, and there's the youth that can go out into the field much better than I can. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, there is a lot of there. In fact, you know, the iron is one thing, but there are other similarities that connect this, the masks together um, and uh, and really start showing that, look, folks, there, there's a common source with all of this. And we need to start tracking that back and we need to start interrogating it. This is what I've been asking the question of, is it all the same damn thing posing as other things like Carlos Castaneda's mud shadows, right? This this idea mm. that it's just sort of a fog permeating this place. It can appear as your dead grandma, as as anything, yeah, right? as yeah, a yeah. Gin, as poltergeist. Yeah, as, yeah, yeah. yeah and absolutely. So you say across cultures, just to clarify, I just want to make sure I heard you right, uh, is that across cultures, these different variety of entities all have an aversion to iron. That's one common thing that, that's reported with gin, and, and you said a few others? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that goes, interesting. It, right across the board, there's this common factor in which they are petrified of iron. Now there are the there mineral. are there are aspects of that that we're that we're that we're examining, and and I'm working on it now with the next book, breaking that down to understand what is it about the iron, and also what is it about iron if you wear an iron amulet. That's what I was thinking. Iron cross. Um, yeah. What happens when you go underground because it doesn't work? That rule doesn't apply the moment you go underground into a cave system or a tunnel. Um, so why? So those are the things that we're now breaking down and, and, and going into and look at looking at the different aspects that could activate the iron and what the iron is doing to the environment around it and why they in particular are afraid of it. You use the term attack. It's it's attacking. What are we talking about when you when you when you say attack? Um, well, if, if we look at the, the, the night attacks in its truest form, I'm not talking about sleep paralysis. I'm talking about the night attack when it, when, when it will make itself known. Um, the person, it's, the person that, that's usually witnessing it can't move. They're held in place um, and there's a, there's a weight um, pushed onto them. But the difference between the ones that, that I tend to look at and, and the sleep paralysis is that their partners can be lying asleep or, or sorry, lying awake beside them. And they're witnessing this manifestation occur and, and, and the fear that is generating within their partner as this thing approaches and, and, and begins its, its, I suppose, um, sourcing its, its fuel. It's, it's the, the, the fear that's being generated. The moment that these, that the partners move or make any, any, suggestion that they're awake that's it it stops it's gone and um, so this this removes it from uh the the hallucination which psychologists would suggest is, is going on here but there there are fur there's further research that needs to be done in this particular avenue um, and, and i feel that yes we're aware that there's that there's the weights that are that are talked about throughout the attacks this this oppressive weight that pushes people down into their beds i spoke to one farmer here in ireland and and he was he was being attacked and he said he has he has he has raised cattle all his life and he has never felt weight just quite like what this thing is he says it's heavier than any cow he's ever he's ever raised um but the thing is, from my perspective, if we, if we are able to get someone into a sleep clinic, um, and uh, and and the attacks are 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 pretty regular, let's put the bed onto a set of scales. Is the weight? Is that a physical weight? No one's doing these tests. No one's asking those questions. 
Is it a physical weight that we can actually register? Because if it's a physical weight that we can register, that changes everything. That 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 really turns turns the 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 bathwater um, out onto the street, um, and uh, and that changes, as I say, that changes everything from that point on. So, I just gotta say, this is fascinating. Um, I looked it up real quick. Five percent of Earth's crust is iron. So, what about just sort of your your curiosity, uh, your insight on the inner Earth dwelling aliens? Do you think that they have a tough time being here due to this? Sort of, uh, I mean, it's five percent, but it could be in pockets, right uh, under the ground. This element's pretty prolific, prolific here. So, do you think that that affects the inner Earth dwellings and tunnel systems and stuff like that? Nope, because there are certain components which work with the iron on the surface. Um, I can't get into details at the moment, um, but there are there are two main components that work with the iron on the surface. Just an interesting uh, thing. Now I'm thinking of plasma weapons with iron in them, you know, and um, thinking of uh, beings like octopuses that are mostly silica comprised, but also have copper in their blood. So these different elements and minerals seem to play a large part of something here. And I think it's interesting what you've touched on with the iron. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. It is indeed. But um, Barry, excuse me, for coming from different sites here I'm all over the place with my questions but um <laughs> everything is so interesting so in, in in what ways do you believe the various disguises these uh, multi-dimensional beings whatever they are uh, adopt serve to distract us from their true identity or can you can you come up with some examples of these dis disguises well the disguises uh, um my own personal experiences with the grays um i've had an experience with those um and and the jinn the fairy um and uh, the old gods um and the incubi so i've i've experienced those particular components and and seen their weaknesses um and how they interacted um now with every manifestation it, there's a slight difference in it never mind the appearance but the slight difference in way in the way that they interact with us but their weaknesses remain the same. And, and that was imperative to understand that, hold on a second, folks, we're looking at potentially the same thing. And when, when we look at the likes of the UFO um, phenomena, for instance, the, the likes of the animal mutilations that, that are known to go on, this is not something that stopped 10 or 20 years ago. No, this is something that still continues. But... We've had the mutilations now for quite some time being attributed to the UFOs. Mm -hmm. But if we if we go back uh, to 1900, say, here in, in Ireland, we have a, a story of a farmer here in Leitrim who, who the, 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 the calf was born. He was very happy with it. And he put the, 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 the mother and the calf in the barn beside his, his cottage. He got up the next morning and both the calf and the mother were sliced and diced. Um, the it was the the typical um, uh, mutilation associated with the, the the gray aliens, but he blamed the fairy. The fairy also did this, and we see when we go back into the French, uh, the Middle Ages, there are French um, um, wood carvings there that'll show these these imps, these these demons spiking people in the abdomen. Um, again, it's the same phenomena. It's just a different mask. It's the way it's being interpreted. It's the way that they wish it to be interpreted. Because by doing that, then we never actually put it into historical context to see that these have been here. These are here and have been here way before we were. Um, but the problem is that they also need us at certain levels. So... If we were to find out how they actually interacted with us and why they interacted, they wanted to interact, that would cause absolute mayhem, I suspect, um, because then we would find out that the body is not our own divinity. It's not as precious as, uh, as we were thought to believe. Um, and this idea of, of soul, spirit, um, um, and, and, and body creating this trinity um, 
things are not as what we were led to believe and it turns our world upside down. But again, I can't get into that. I'm sorry I can't get into that because that's the next book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the why, why is a big question. Why? The description of your book speaks of the puppet masters promising yes. power and the wealth while sacrificing the innocent. Can you tell us more about the motivation of uh, or, or the identity of these puppet masters? Puppet masters themselves, um, that, that is the phenomenon. That is what's coming through the, the, the void. There is a there is an element of um, of the uh, the natural order of things that that has been upset and has been upset for quite some time. In fact, when this upset occurred, it created a great divergence within within the humanity's timeline, and that's when we began to know what we would call the demonic. Um, and I'm not talking about this aspect of biblical context and all the rest. It's nothing to do with that. Um, it's just an element within our timeline. And that's where we began to know the, what we would associate with the demonic, the worst of humanity, the worst aspects of humanity, which in itself is not ours. That belongs to them. And It's, it's this, and, and understanding as well that there's a certain element within the body. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I have to be careful about what I'm saying here because of the next book, but there's a certain element within the body that, um, how do I put this into? There's a certain element within the body where all our psychic abilities originate. And I mean all of them remote viewing, um, ESP, all of that, it's all produced by this particular component, which doesn't belong to us. Can you get more into when you I'm, af I'm afraid I can't go any further than that because of the next book. Okay. Um, but this particular book, the, 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 the deceptions of gods and men, yes, it does look at the puppet masters. It looks at who is pulling the strings and from where. Um, and and when we see the likes of um, magnetic anomalies are key factors around the planet, we'll see the 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 the, the, the uh, positive magnetic anomalies along with the, the the negative magnetic anomalies. Now you tend to see more larger magnetic anomalies in the southern hemisphere than you do in the north, but within these particular components, within these these areas, in the stronger areas you tend to find these are the places where you tend to find the doorways, these portals, which are being utilized back and forth. If we look at the likes of Skinwalker Ranch, for instance, in, in Utah, which in itself we were told, oh, it was this mad place of, of all this UFO and, and dog men and everything else that was going on. Absolute nonsense, by the way. Utter, utter nonsense. But... I have to say that the magnetic anomaly that is associated with that particular area is around 80 miles. So it stretches much more than the ranch. There is a, there is strange, high strangeness within the area, but it is not focused on the ranch. The ranch is something different, which is man-made. Um, I'm not going, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there in regards to the ranch, but it is, it's, Yeah, um, that would annoy me greatly about what the ranch actually turned out to be. Um, but you have other areas as well um, in which the likes of, of people will, will be, they'll be out walking and hiking, um, especially within the national parks in the US. You'll get these places where people are hiking Yosemite, um, the Three Sisters up in, 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 in um, I think it's in Oregon, spread across where people are hiking and suddenly, You're talking to your friend beside you and you look back, you look where you're walking and you turn back to your friend and they're gone. Like that, they're absolutely gone. Now, David Politis is an ex-police officer uh, within the States and he has done extensive work in this. His work correlates with our work and that the people, that the clusters of people that he has missing within the national parks also tie in with positive magnetic anomalies. We also tend to see that, that these areas 
have high outputs of UFO, of cryptids, um, of poltergeist activity, paranormal hauntings. All of this stuff tends to go on within these particular key areas. These are doorways, portals, if you like. But there's something else on the other side which we need to look at. And again, we're looking, we're starting to stray back into this aspect of the puppet masters. Uh, because within the negative magnetic anomalies, I started seeing that that 70% of the world's top, sorry, 75% of the world's top suicide locations appear in negative magnetic anomalies. I also found that our ancestors were sacrificing people and animals within the negative magnetic anomalies predominantly. Um, and, uh, and what we also saw whenever we started putting in the, the data is that, and, and bear in mind, this is the place where I suppose blood worship was really, was really being utilized in these negative areas. We find that 70% of the world's weapons manufacturing and development also appears in negative magnetic anomalies. Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this out here and just leave it there. Um, in that we have gone from one or two sheep or goats, as our ancestors were doing, to now we're producing weapons that are killing millions of people. The blood um, loss there is is huge, or blood worship. Take it whatever way you want, um, but something's being paid back. Now, we do see that, that there are elements of the uh, industrial military complex that do reach into these areas of the paranormal um, and try to gain um, um, information from them. So if we look at, uh, there, there's a particular airline company, the, the Douglas, um, I think it's Douglas uh, uh, Airlines, uh, back in the 1960s, I have the, uh, the, the paperwork here somewhere, um, and they were trying to ascertain new engine designs, advanced engine designs, um, and uh, from their communications of these things from beyond the void. Now, they were on government money, and clearly I could see through the, the reports where they were going wrong. Um, they were utilizing government money, and they were using Ouija boards to connect to something beyond that was promising to give them information as long as they tagged along. Um, and again, this is something that we see time and time again. They'll draw you in to the communication and then they'll expect you to adhere to every letter of the law that they dictate. If you don't, you're kicked out. You're gone. Um, you're excommunicated, if you like. Um, and uh, and clearly on, on the paperwork from, from the Douglas um, Aeronautic Company, um, they were dealing with stuff that went above their heads. Now I went through with, it with a red marker and I'm going, uh, 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 I could see where the, where the issues were um, that, that, that they were blind to. And, uh, but they're, they're not the only company. We see that there are, and still, um, aspects of the the um, military and uh, industrial complex that are still utilizing that um, for their for their benefit. Now, in regards to again uh, communicating, there there were um, a series of exceptional um, seances that were that were occurring in the UK back in the nineteen nineties. I think it was ninety five, and it ran for five years. Now, this was over in uh, on the east of, of England, and scientists were queuing up to get into this because the phenomena was manifesting in solid form. Um, and when you've got when you've got people who are sitting in absolute darkness um, and uh, and they feel this hand grasp their arm, and they'll reach over and grab the hand and follow up until they get to the elbow. After the elbow, there's nothing. But anything can be manifested when you're dealing with this phenomenon. Anything can be manifested. And this, this was making itself clear within the seance rooms. And between small UFOs that were appearing, and thank God I was not in that seance room because had a small UFO passed by me, 
that would have been it. I would have had it proof there in my hand. Um, but um, these things were, were, they were appearing, they were manifesting. And interestingly also, gray aliens were appearing in the seance room. Why? In something which was designed to talk to our ancestors, the people are, are the people who passed before us. What the hell is a gray alien doing manifesting in the seance room? Same phenomena, different mask. But the people predominantly had to work in darkness within the seance room. And this was aggravating because 20 years before in the Livermore Laboratories in the United States, scientists were working there in broad daylight, receiving the same style of, of uh, phenomena. Now, they thought they were going absolutely crazy. Um, when, when you've got, you know, you're, you're back in your home and these things are manifesting around in your home and um, following you back. So again, you know, we're led to believe that, that, well, we, we have to, we have to work a seance in the darkness because the spirits like it. The spirits don't give a damn. Clearly they can work in daylight. And when we go back 20 years, we can see that the, these, these phony laws that come in are to fool us. Um, it's not to benefit them. Brandon, I'm sure you're on fire already. Allow me one uh, thing. I want to add, add one thing to something you said. Uh, you, you said uh, you talked about negative magnetic areas. And mm. immediately I had to think about um, the suicide forest in Japan. Yes, that's one of them. Aokigahara, I think it's called uh, Aokigahara. And yeah. yeah, I had to think about it. We have tons of um, missing... Uh, person cases there and and suicides every year and it's crazy it could be one yeah. of these yeah ne uh, magnetic negative magnetic areas yeah just wanted to and add pacific that. northwest of the u.s uh, is one of these places it's a high suicide rate they say seattle but um mm. i don't know if that's due to the magnetic anomaly or just the weather you know because it's bumming yeah yeah it's cloudy all the time well they've, they've known for a long time um, you know, there were even Russian reports there about uh, about the effects that the land has on our our minds um, and how it can affect us. So, and I think that report is around. I think that was in the nineteen early nineteen eighties. It was committed. Are these magnetic anomalies tracked on ley lines, or how do, how can you discover these places or map them out? Satellite. Um. The the information is there. It's free on uh, it's it's a it's a it's an overlay on google maps um and uh, and that that works wonders it'll for tell us. you it'll tell you tells what type you, of polarization the yeah the magnetic uh, and shows you how how big it is now we have to give some 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 flexibility because the magnetic anomaly of course over the course of days and weeks will rise it'll, it'll increase and then narrow back down again and um, so you you'll get this constant movement with it but primarily what you're seeing is a fixed moments in time within within those particular images from satellite it's like installment louche farms on the realm it, it ensures that there is an ebb and flow of chaos uh mm. distributed throughout this place and in certain areas where i mean if you're talking the japanese forest we all get heavy just hearing that and then you think that maybe that maybe it wasn't like that and these gravitational anom or magnetic anomalies can be altered in some way and maybe some ancients knew about this with i think of the star forts i think of these ancient cathedrals that no longer work right mm. uh, that they were huge these they had these massive organs these cymatic patterns inside the windows and this idea that all these bells were around and maybe it was to keep the i don't know the cracking of these magnetic anomalies away and maybe it was just a way to harmonize with frequency and vibration in a way that now they've been either deliberately destroyed or just don't work anymore something like that or apprehended on purpose so that they don't work well, the, ga the gatekeepers, certainly from an Irish perspective, the gatekeepers were giant serpents. They were always seen as, as, as these, these beings that handed over the information and knowledge um, to the people that entered the chambers to commune with these beings. And it wasn't that you entered it at a, at, at, at whenever you wanted. Um, no, there were certain time periods that these temples were, were, were orchestrated to use and and haven't been in, in many of them. We we have temples here that predate the Great Pyramids of Giza, and we can enter them 24-7, 365 days a year, these massive stone mounds. Now, it's it's interesting from, from, uh, from a folkloric perspective, because we've got elements such as such as the Banshee, this this female entity that's said to announce death 
um, and, and the people that hear the scream understand that that death is coming to the person that didn't hear it. Now, Ban and She comes from the ancient Irish, which translates into woman of the she. But the she, people believe, were the fairy. Not quite. She are the mounds, the stone mounds. Ban, she is woman of the mounds. These beings are coming through the gateways from the old worlds. Um, and, and these people that had built these original stone mounds, like the one behind me here, uh, they were coming from Syria and Iraq. And we know this from the DNA. So they were, and, and, and the mound builders were moving with the sun. They were moving from east to west. And by the time they finished here in Europe, of course, they were already appearing in, uh, in, in the Americas at that particular stage. Um, but it's interesting from our perspective that when we look at it from, from a Nordic um, element in that pre-Christian Nordic traditions were that were the, these places were associated with ancestral worship. That's where you brought the dead to. So they believed that when uh, you died, um, you were brought to these places and, uh, and you were left. Now, during the stage in which the soul decoupled, and whether it took two days or, or two weeks, it they believed that it, it went through a state of metempsychosis. It altered its appearance before entering the mound. It became a serpent and it entered the mounds. So we see this tradition moving its way down into, into, into Ireland and, and the British Isles, the rest of the British Isles. Um, but from our perspective, uh, when Christianity came to the island, it really came with absolutely nothing because we already had our saints and gods and everything else already established. Um, and uh, But we had St. Patrick who came to the island and rid it of serpents. What bloody serpents? There never were serpents except the ones that were associated with the ancient doorways. Um, so, yeah, it's... Uh, it's an interesting history whenever we start going back and start stripping it back bit by bit and looking at the way that uh, that we dealt with things back then. But around 2600 BC, something went something went wrong. And I, I, I can never find out what exactly it was because we had uh, the, 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 the mounds that were that were orientated to the to the summer solstice, uh, which were masculine, but the feminine. Um, for the winter solstice, the majority of those were absolutely all destroyed. Um, they've all been wiped out, bar one or two, which can never find out why, what happened. Um, now, of course, you know we see this. We've seen this drive when Christianity came. We we had this aspect of the feminine, the oracle, um, was was alienated along with the serpent, the giver of the knowledge. Um, so, was this the old religion that we've seen in the mounds? Um, finally, the the masculine authority came down and stamped on it and said no more. But uh, it's finding a revival again. It's uh, I'm seeing elements of it coming back again. You mentioned banshee, so it's the mm. the messenger of death, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting and an X Men, very cool. Oh yeah, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, in in Germany, this it would be the the owl, or in the in the Latin American folklore, I think it's called La Lorana. And in Scotland, there's something similar to Bean Nai, Bean Nahi. I don't know. Um, also in Germany, we have the Wild Hunt. Have you heard about the Wild Hunt? I have, yes. Uh -huh. yeah, interesting. Um, it's it's an interesting legend. People that uh, observe the Wild Hunt, they say, um, yeah, they probably if you, if you observe the Wild Hunt, if you see these, uh, the Wild Hunt pass by, you might die or meet disaster. Um, mm -hmm. In the Slavic folklore, there is the Rusalka. These are also, you could say, messengers of death. So we have this. We have that everywhere. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Um, I want to add something because you talked about the Skinwalker Ranch, and you talked about it being some kind of nonsense, and um, but you said there's high strangeness in the area. Yes. So any idea, um about the origin of the high strangeness in the area, because 
if it w wouldn't be for the Skinwalker Ranch, there would be nothing out there, literally. So, any idea? Oh, there's there's plenty. There's plenty out there. Um, but I think there's there's a huge majority of that. Um, you, you got to understand that that um, in the U Uinta Basin, there there were vast gold reserves discovered, um, and and silver and and also radioactive material as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, looking at that, um, you know, there's there's quite a lot to be said for this, especially whenever we, we look at the show now that's being filmed and um, the way it's being portrayed. Uh, we've got scientists there that, that were head of, of, of designing equipment to look for deep pockets of heavy metals, scanning for deep pockets of heavy metals. So now we've got these scientists on site that are, that have, uh, we're, we're behind this particular um, um, stuff. And, you know, from, from a Celtic perspective, again, you know, getting back to that, uh, the giant serpents also were associated with, with natural treasures, gold and silver and things again. Now, from our perspective, from a Celtic perspective, if we were to show them Puff the Magic Dragon nowadays, they would have no idea what the hell that was. But the giant serpent migrated and, and transformed into what we associate a dragon as today. So who guards Skinwalker Ranch with rifles and guns? The dragon. That's the guy's name on the TV show. The dragon, the dragon guards the wealth. Hmm. Um, now, there's all of this that, that, that goes on there, but a huge nearly all of it, there is no proof for any of the phenomena that was written about in the books. None. Not one ounce was there of proof. In both books, I got to say, none. There was a, there was a guy, Stephen um, um, Greenstreet, exceptional reporter for the New York Post, went into this and delved into Skinwalker Ranch and he let it bear. And the new owner, of course, um, didn't didn't take um, too lightly to this, and uh, and of course he he called everyone that wanted proof pigs live um, um, in the public domain. He called us all pigs, nothing better than swine. Okay, just because we wanted proof for the claims that were being made. So, I'm interested in your opinion. Do, was these two worlds, our world, our so-called reality and the other realm, were these two worlds meant to collide? I mean, it's a question probably impossible to answer, I know, but what's your opinion? Do you think these worlds were meant to collide or did something happen somewhere that opened up something or are these worlds connected is it meant to be? What is your opinion? Well, what if I put it to you this way? Um, what if the idea of other the other realm was an illusion? What if there was an actual geological location that this originates from? Maybe under our feet. Maybe by a life force that's minuscule. Um, but a life force that was here long before we were. I might have said too much. Say more. <laughs> Don't be shy. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a, a little inclusion into the next book there. So, but you're talking about everything. Does it mean that includes UFO sightings, all that stuff, right? As I said, anything can be manifested. Anything can be manifested, and it's not us doing the manifesting. We shouldn't get lost in this idea of what we're seeing in the mainstream media now of UAPs. Um, those are black budget projects. Um, mainstream media, the legacy media is running with this and they're selling us stuff, which let's face it, is nothing more than a bag of air. Grush in, in, in the, the Senate reports is giving us absolutely nothing. We know nothing more than we did 50 years ago. It's all hearsay. 
Now, for someone who experienced something 50 years ago, they were called absolute nuts because there was no proof. And yet we've got people now are coming forward, giving us information of which there is no proof. Nothing. This is my question. How, how are we still so... How are a lot of us still very hell-bent on the fact that proof needs to be established before any sort of entertainment of the idea that something else is going on here, that you're something else or this reality is something else, when we live in a reality that can absolutely be manipulated all the way down to the atom around you all the time? And who's to say that it's not? And this isn't just a screen that you're being shown and can change in any way. So again, this this idea of the demand for proof, this consensus reality for that which can be shared with others, seems a little asinine at this point, doesn't it? In a world that manip matter can be manipulated, unmanipulated, alien can be there, dies, phases off into something. You hear about this Bigfoot. Uh, oh, I saw a dead Bigfoot die right in front of me, and then it glittered off into smoke, and then it disappeared. So matter, there is no evidence. This the phenomena doesn't want to leave evidence. So why are we so insistent on it? I think for us, um, we live in a materialistic world. I think there's a certain element in that in which we need something, something that we can grasp um, that will help us understand that. At present, there is absolutely nothing that's being delivered. So from that particular perspective, is if nothing is being delivered, where does the boundaries end? Those boundaries then become endless. Um, and uh, I, I think for a lot of people, the need, the need certain elements in which they can relate to, um, and until those are brought forward, I think that's that's going to be that's going to be an, an absolute problem. There, yes, there are aspects in which people who of similar mind who can accept. Yes, there are things are changing at the atomic level and everything else around us all the time. That's okay, but for a huge amount of the population who are coming home and, and switching on their TVs, um, that's their life. So they can't. They, they would find it very, very difficult to step outside that to look at a greater perspective. I, I think that's where the, the, the problem would lie um, from that. But the problem, the, there's, there's also this element in which the people who are telling us um, there's there's a, an absolute high level of deceit that's coming from particular areas within our within our higher um, elite area that is selling us an agenda which is not it, it, it's wrong it's completely wrong when we delve into it we find hole after hole after hole after hole honest to god if this was was a ship it would have sank before it even left port um, there's that many holes in, in the stories that they're giving us. Um, but I, I, I think for us, when we're able to sit back and say, okay, we have something here. How do we understand that? At least from that particular perspective, we're able to move forward because there is something there. Up until now, we're getting nothing. The phenomena, the true phenomena, certainly does not want us to have anything. Um, because that leads back to the origin point. And if we find out the origin point, then there'd be trouble. What if the collective evidence is the fact that an experience was had that they can't tell anyone about, and that we as a collective humanity probably all have experiences where we wished to articulate our perspective in a way and weren't heard? That seems to be the common evidence that's left with this, is simply the emotional connection that we all feel from not having mm. been heard of something that we can't necessarily prove. You think mm. of victims of horrible assault or something like this being the worst case scenarios of this. But especially in, in terms like this, I think it still applies. Now, I think that we as humanity can, now that we've had this conversation, and it's beautifully put the way you did, transcend that idea and look at the commonality, which is that we're all humans having some sort of experience here that a lot of people, when they can't explain a little bit of the cave that you're not on the side of, that they're experiencing and yelling at you from that cave, hey, here's what I found, you're not over there. You don't know what they found. But what you can experience is from your own perspective, yelling mm -hmm. as well to people who can't see your side of the cave. Mm -hmm. So there, I think that that's the evidence that's left. And if we can just focus on that this is, we're all in this together kind of a thing and not let things like these nuances, no, mine was gray, no, my gray alien was brown, yours is totally different, so therefore you're full of shit kind of a thing, mm, then mm. maybe there would be just sort of a community that can come together because I think shining light on whatever the hell this thing 
is is going to show that all of it's the same thing and that we can relate in this way maybe absolutely you, you don't have an argument for me and that's that's perfectly put yeah fair enough i just like your perspective this is fascinating i can't wait for the next book honestly man oh, I know thank, there's thank been you. a lot of shitload of teasers in this one and i'm grateful for that i think it's awesome <laughs> I am curious if you don't mind uh, to ask what it feels like, because it sounds like you've had experiences with this phenomena that's w shown up in your in your experience, your personal life experience, wearing many masks. Yes. How was it that you transcended it? Was if you don't have a bar of iron hanging out in your pocket, what is what is your go to method for just getting any nasty thing that's off of you away from you that you don't want to interact with? Um, first of all, good science starts with an ob observation. We have to observe it. And that's what I've spent years doing in the field, observing it, interacting with it. Um, and I've, I've been in places, you know, funny enough, you, you talk about, about being in a cave and, 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 and screaming for your friend and, and your friend can't, can't, can't hear you. I have been there. I have done that. In, in a cave of 30 feet, I lost my friend and his son for 45 minutes. Um, I, I, I thought to myself, I'm going to have to phone the the, the authorities here to uh, to let them know that there's dis these people have disappeared. Um, but uh, again, the, the, these things happen. But the experiences that I've had have helped me develop, uh, observe, um, interact, and with the interaction, also, I've been able to break down how there were there were. Um, coming in, how they were, how they were doing what they were doing. And, and the iron was, was, was a huge part of that um, to understand what they were doing from, from that particular perspective and why, why did they wait until the, 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 the women of humanity entered their monthly cycle before they made their, their leap onto it. Now there are occasions whenever you can draw things back, back to your home. That's, that's, part and parcel of it you know you you, you got you, you got to experience that as well um we've had we've had phenomena here um that has appeared in our home before that as well um but for the most part it doesn't it doesn't stay around for too long it comes in who are you it's as curious a lot of the times it's as curious as we are about it you know so this is honestly my question here barry do you think that there's a way once recognized that we could work with this energy in a way that's mutually exclusive, that's not contract uh, by, uh, binding in a way that would exploit your sovereignty in any way? Almost this idea of being scared of a dragon or a large snake, as you say, that's apprehending the treasure. Perhaps the treasure is your friendship together, you know, the friends you make along the way, right? And maybe this idea of throwing the reins around this dragon or this a metaphor for the entity, the treasure, right, is the true gift in itself. And that is where your inner power comes from. Because it seems this idea of cat and mouse, this, there are things around you, you got to watch out, you got to watch your sovereignty, keep some iron around you. I think these are all interesting. But this idea then to me is, is, well, if there is a symbiotic relationship that can be occurred, then also we have scalable models for this in our reality with the little birds that land on hippos and pick the ticks off of their back with the ones that the little fish that swim along with sharks for the same reason. It seems that there is a need for our interaction. So the discovery of the ways in which it's been apprehended to a malicious intent, perhaps against our awareness, uh, can be brought to the life of day so that maybe we could say, Hey, look, you can hang out, but we've got boundaries here that we need to establish. Do you think that that's something that's possible for us? In regards to that specific phenomena that you're talking about, um, because there, are, it's a duality. Um, there is part of it that is already in us. There is part of it which is exterior. The exterior we can never work with. What's already in us, we can, because it's all part of the same source. And you talk about small. I'm thinking by uh, bacteria, I'm thinking something so small that this is the spaceship that it's driving around is us. It's our it's our vehicle here. It's sort of this idea that shrooms, magic mushrooms, the spores themselves, it's an entity here that apprehends your consciousness. Everybody takes mushrooms, loves the environment, which then therefore benefits the mushroom, right? So you have this entity that's apprehending your consciousness to benefit itself in the parasitic way. This is my question as we change it from parasite to bacteria, to functioning organisms working together under a common goal with no sort of sovereignty being negated in that. 
Now, that's the question, though. Is the idea that we have sovereignty just sort of this something that a bunch of bacteria would say, uh, you know, kind of a thing? And it's it's sort of this carrot on a stick idea that really just enables us to feel that we're in more control or have more power than we actually do. Well, I, I think there, there's there's a great uh, statistic that's out there, um, and it's something like the cells that make up our body that belong to us, they're around 57%. The rest is bacteria and everything else that goes with that. So that just messes up with our minds that we're not all complete. Um, when it's not all of us, there are other things there. Mitochondria DNA is another example of a symbiotic relationship, which is lives in each of our cells. You know, um, it, it, because when you talk about that, the things out there you can't touch or do anything with, it's this idea that they're being projected from you. So if there is an entity in you that's of a certain type, let's say of a certain gray, or it, it filters your consciousness in that way because that's what you most relate to. Maybe that's angels for some, demons for others. But it's it's almost like it's being projected through you. And the sigil of Satan is the same exact way that your eye pattern works. Did you guys know this? Have you seen that? So the sigil of Satan or the Lucifer is the exact way it's a cross section of how your two eyes work and your vision crosses to then reflect back to you, which mm -hmm. is this light bringer idea. So again, it feels like the something in you is projecting the UFO out there to give you that experience, which again could be this idea of proof. There's no proof because it comes from you. It's it's a psychosemantic thing. Even uh, Jacques Vallée, um, Heineck at the end of his life with Sufos was talking about this, that it's a psychosemant, it's possibly a psychosemantic phenomenon to where it's being generated by us. And then you have this co-collective creative consciousness sort of element, the CE5 groups and things that come together, all of their bacteria are of the same species of alien. And then they all come together and get to call in or project out uh, more reinforcing ideas that reinforce their own independent ideas. And so it's this interesting sort of collection of bacteria uh, that's driving us around <laughs> to project things out that we find interesting. Oh, I can't wait till you read the next book. Oh, I can't wait to read your next book, dude. It's just you, you, you make, you bring up great questions, which that's what this is about, right? I mean, the answer to life is the mastery of questions. The guy said that on the show, Andrew Benjamin, one time. I always cite him, and it's it's this idea, even even the idea of like the matter is manipulative and that it can be projected in any way around you. This, when you were talking about this, I'm just gonna say this, and I'll I'll let you finish up here, man. But I'm just you fire me up is what I'm saying, Barry. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Daniel, for the opportunity. When you said places for the dead, I'd never thought about it before, but even the idea that an afterlife exists that you are being contacted from is an apprehension across the board. The thought, because if you think about it, some people are contacted by aliens, and maybe they're not as convincing as the dude that was contacted by his grandma. And the grandma is an ancestor that they all saw in real life, that this tribe, let's keep it very simple, tribe of 20, Grandma dies. They all grew up around this grandma. She dies. An alien force comes in and takes advantage of this opportunity, projects itself as grandma, as an ancestor, which maybe doesn't exist at all. Maybe grandma's just damn gone, or maybe it's just a character in a game and it dissolves and there is no such thing. Then as we, as the phenomena keeps projecting dead ancestors around us, oh yeah, I saw Mary Antoinette. Oh, that's crazy. Like these sort of things presuppose automatically to the observer that the afterlife is a thing. So again, this idea of places for the dead could be another psyop altogether, that, that, that there is no sort of ancestors that are visiting you. And I really think of this in the work of Howdy Mikowski, and again, the Na uh, Gnostics and the Cathars idea that everything here is an apprehension. So even that specific idea that there's a way to do this, that there's instructions from the other side that you'll also be able to receive from someone that you're visually familiar with in your environment. That's interesting and it kind of terrifying all at the same time. So again, you bring up fascinating questions, Barry. Thank well, you. Bear, bear in mind that uh, our history is in our aura and that can be read. Um, and uh, and my, my advice when dealing with great aunt Bertha <laughs> that has died and passed over and she comes forward and she, just as everyone remembers her, press her. Fucking Be sure for information, and you'll soon find out that Aunt Bertha is not Aunt Bertha. This is what I'm saying. So how can we trust that any ancestor or any apparition of any kind of ilk of anything is what it says it is, first of all, and that therefore any of those modus operandi, meaning, i.e., an afterlife, exists at all? Those Son are the questions that are going to start developing. 
<laughs> second book coming soon. Damn. Coming to a good bookstore near you. <laughs> yeah. Coming to this house right here near me very soon. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. Definitely. Wow. Barry, but we can't let you off the hook until I um until you have answered me a few more questions that came up a few minutes ago. And although we already changed the subject a few minutes ago, I want to come back to something. I'm sure. very sorry. Um when I stalked your profile for research, I found uh, a post that you that you made. Um if you don't mind, I, I'll quote you. I'm it it said, I'm pondering some thoughts and wondering if a USO doesn't show up on radar. Is that an indication of stealth technology? And yet they use various bright lights that are visible to all. Mm. Could that be fooling us into thinking there is something more substantial there when in reality it's just an illusion or hallucination either on a mass or individual level? Mm. Can you please <laughs> elaborate on that? A little bit uh, more. Well, you know, when when we're told that there's a there's a UFO sailing around the Earth every eight seconds, um, where where are all of these? You know, there there are certain the certain amounts of UFOs that are appearing. Yes, they do live in radar trace, and there were others that we were told were radar traces, which in itself was just a problem with the radar. Um, but when we've got these things that are flying around, um. And there are there are no radar um, uh, things with them. That gives you the impression that you know almost as if uh, is this stealth to try and nip through and 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 do what it's doing. But whenever it's doing this, it's got these huge blasted big headlights on it that will flash and flash and flash. Say, look at me, look at me, look at me, um, which in itself creates a conscious connection um, in the observer. And uh, you know that that's really what it was about to, to, to question: Are we looking at, at two different things here, or are we looking at the same thing? It was to see people's opinions on it, but I don't believe there was much much response to that um, um, thought process that went out. I don't remember the comments. I think one guy commented. I'm just... mm -hmm. I have a comment. Would you like it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, something interesting about this is as you're talking about it, it being visible, but not visible, it wanting, then therefore it wants us to think it's solid, even though it's possibly not. In this, I think of mimic mimicry in nature. You have these butterflies that have, when they open their wings, mm. they have the, the eyes of the owl that predates on the bird that predates on the moth, right? Yeah. So it looks like the thing that kills the thing that kills the moth. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a mimicry sort of a concept, and you'll see this in cuttlefish, you'll see this in all sorts of things, but also found in nature are angler fish and those things are the bright light little deals that are in deep sea that oh, yeah. have this beautiful mm -hmm. oh my god this light in the darkness thank god and then you swim through it and there's this horrible monster mouth on the other side of it right so it is sort yeah. of this bait and switch kind of thing yeah. possibly that's going on and mm -hmm. maybe even at a long slow game sort of a way you hear these fascinating stories of contacts at last and then it's intergenerational you know it almost seems like they tag you and your family to just constantly get uh, whatever they're getting out of you. Yeah. But it's interesting mm -hmm. to apply the the patterns of nature to what the phenomena is doing as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I was I was in uh, Nevada and uh, sorry Arizona, I think it was. I was in the desert in Arizona, and uh, and these lights appeared on on the desert floor, and I was able to photograph them. But the first night that I went there. Um, initially, I thought there's, there's there's nothing happening here, and and I turned to leave. It says right, that's it. We're finished. Let let's go. We're packing up. And as I turned out of the corner of my eye, these lights appeared. It was as if suddenly, in that particular moment, okay, he's leaving. We got to show, and and it happened. Now the next night, we used the, the 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 satellite, and we said, okay, this is where it was appearing. This is where we need to be. And I want to be there an hour before it appears again because I want to get set up. I want to feel the environment. I want to see what's going on. The moment the car stopped and I got out and my feet hit the ground, boom, they were there. That that actually unnerved me. Um, that particular aspect, because it was as if it was waiting. But not only that, it was the air that I was sensing that was putting me on high alert. 
And I said, I'm not going to stay here for long. <laughs> I got my photographs and I left. Uh, but a strange, it was a strange place, a strange encounter. But it was, uh, again, it was something that, that I was able to, to pull some information from um, and, uh, and bring back. Barry, what is the island of the dead? Oh God, that place. Oh, um, yeah. That, uh, <laughs> that is up in uh, County Donegal and uh, it's on a this small lake and it was a place of Oracle. And it was a place that was used throughout the, the, the medieval period. People were coming from all over Europe to go to this location in which you, you entered the void through the doorway of the serpent. It was a, it was an old ancient mound that was still being utilized there. A very, very, I have to say an exceptionally powerful, naturally powerful place. Uh, and, uh, You went in there, and it, when the church came, it, it became, the name changed and became known as St. Patrick's Purgatory, this place of darkness, utter darkness, where you worked off your, your penance. Um, it was horrific. It was a point in which you could be, um, you could be frightened to the point of death. That's how extreme it was. Now, You know, we heard all these stories whenever we were doing Legend Seekers um, from an Irish perspective. We hear a lot of these and you took it with a pinch of salt and we thought, oh, yeah, it'll be fine. Oh, my God. Yeah, that, that was more than I expected and way more. And in fact, I said, if I ever encounter that again, I'm done. I'm, I'm retiring. That's it. It's, it's over. Um, but uh, yes, the, the, the gate of the serpents was there. It seemed to be some type of connection with the Celts, whatever the Celts had done it created a situation in which this thing was open all the time. It wasn't, it wasn't like the, the other, the others on top of the mountains and things that, that are orientated to the sun um, and the moon and, and various things. This was all the time. So there are no animals on the Island um, nothing like that. Um, and the, the plans of the Island from the 1600s are as, as is today. Um, the, the the vegetation has not changed and uh, I think it was the north of the island you had the the island or the the place of the angels and the, the south of the island you had the, the pits and the place of the demons well the only place we could camp was in the pits and so of course that's where we stayed and and, and everything unfolded there but I have to say the experience that I had there looking back now the experience that I had, Uh, was was so severe that it lifted me off the railway tracks that I was on and set me on a new track. It completely changed my paradigm. And uh, and that's whenever I started to make the connections then with the old gods, the, the, the mounds and everything else about what was going on. But I have been back to the Island of the Dead because I only spent one night on it and that was enough for me. Um, I have been back in daylight and, and we took a piece of equipment with us which it's a time differential um, piece in which you have two extensions on one end, you've got a computer and the other one is, is a, a sensor in which it's sending the signals back and forward. Um, and with the, the distance, the 100, the 100 feet distance in line, um, it's accounting for the, the time to make sure that, it's, that both are, are working together. This was the first place that I had ever, ever seen such a discrepancy in time. The probe was in the mound um, and, uh, and it was doing its thing, but we were registering on the computer a discrepancy in time. That was the first time I had ever seen that for myself. Um, so it's, it's a very, very powerful place um, and not to be underestimated. Will I stay again? Absolutely not. Um, I'm, uh, I'm done with that now. I move on to other, other things. Quite interesting, man. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah, wow. Um, another thing that I wanted to ask, uh, we touched the subject briefly uh, uh, at the beginning of the show, um, and maybe I missed it, but what part does sleep paralysis play in all that? 
Well, sleep paralysis is slightly different. The, the, there's a difference in the sleep paralysis um, because that's scientifically recognized and there are particular patterns for that. Um, so yes, I'll identify the sleep paralysis, but what I'm looking at is this other aspect because the sleep paralysis tends to move into areas where um, there tends to be a lot of um, sexual activation that is happening there within the sleep paralysis, which is which in itself is a kind of reflection on the on the the mindset of the person that's experiencing it. The phenomena that I'm looking at is the reverse of that. It's the fear generator that I'm looking at, um, which sets that apart from sleep paralysis. Within psychiatry, they'll see that as as being a, a reflection on 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 the, the deep deep situations going on within within the uh, the experiencer. But I'm not I'm not interested per se in in the the scientific analysis of sleep paralysis. I'm looking at this other fear based one um, because that is the one which attacks when the iron is low. Um, the sleep paralysis does not. Um, it's something completely different. Mm -hmm. You've also talked about exploring its weaknesses, the weaknesses of these uh, phenomena. Mm -hmm. What are the weaknesses? What do we know? Iron, of course, is, is, is one. Ultraviolet light is another one, strangely enough. Uh, and early on, um, and we, we discovered that actually um, during the manifestation, infrared light can also have a, can, can play a, a problem with manifestation. Um, it burns the manifestation like acid does our skin. Uh, so from our perspective, coming from, from a ghost hunting show where everyone's running around with infrared technology, and I go, uh, guys, we need to turn this down. Uh, we need to, we need to work with it. Let's try not, not alienate it. Let's, let's try and work with it and, and, and get it to come through and give something back to the people who are watching the show. Uh, but we also discovered as well that along with the iron, the ultraviolet creates a safe room. And um, it's not a permanent solution. Um, it just creates a safe room in which part of this manifestation cannot materialize within ultraviolet light. Mm. Um, and uh, so though that's, that's another aspect of, of the weakness. Can it still have poltergeist type effects just not manifest or does it have no effect whatsoever? It has no effect whatsoever. It just cannot do anything within that particular light spectrum. Which negates its ability to be there. Yeah, it, it, it just simply cannot it cannot materialize. Oh. No spirits allowed sign. I like it. <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty much. Um, and uh, but what we tend to see as as well is that um, you know, looking at this this positive negative thing, um, you often hear tell of uh within the seance rooms when you use pure red light and a red led you tend to get a lot more activity um, the phenomena reaches us easier through the red spectrum materializing into where we are uh, excuse me um, and to come from the other side from the higher spectrum it takes longer to reach us uh, so a lot of the times this is why we say press what you're experiencing, test it, um, that it comes from the lower section. Um, it's easier to reach. We are easier to reach through the reds. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, opposing lights affect each materialization. Ult ultraviolet light affects the, ma the materialization of the lower, and the lower affects the materialization of the higher. The, the, the infrared affects the, the higher materialization. So we have to try and find a balance there in the middle. I did devise a camera. Um, it was called a full spectrum camera um, that that mimicked the child's eye. Because as a child develops, uh, I, I believe um, up until the age of two, predominantly they're in the theta band rhythm, which is where we tend to be for a lot of meditation and things like that. Uh, but they tend to stay within that, predominantly within that. Then they, they move out of that. But between the ages of seven and 13, there's a filter that thickens over the eye, narrowing our, our um, electromagnetic sensitivity. So the camera was devised to open that back up again, but not, produ not to produce light that would absolutely destroy any materialization. So pretty much it was a fly on the wall. 
And we we used to get a lot of stuff through that technology. Um, just sitting there, it was minding its own business, doing absolutely nothing, just recording. And uh, no light source had pulled in its own light, um, low light um, um, sensors and everything else on it. But they were prone to be more sensitive to the outer ranges. Does your research include frequencies and the idea of frequencies? Uh, sometimes, yes. Uh -huh. Certainly for the, the likes of the of the passage chambers and things like that, you know, there's a lot of frequencies there that were being utilized. Uh, Princeton University, they came to, to Ireland back in the, I think it was about 1993, um, and they tested the, the uh, resonance of, of a lot of our stone mounds, like the ones behind me. Um, and uh, it seemed that uh, that they were predominantly um, they resonated at 110 hertz, which was a very, very low, very bassy um, um, resonance that bounced off the walls. But that particular vibration uh, plays a part when you're producing this, this uh, like a Mongolian chant, you know, comes through the chest. So you've got a person at each side that's applying that. You've got the, the, uh, the, the, the oracle, she's at the head of the cruciform, which is exactly what it is. The ground plan within, inside these chambers is a Celtic cross. And they say Christians give it to us. <laughs> um, but this ground plan you've got on, on each side, east, west, you've you've got these, these uh, the, the, the collars, if you like, the vibration producers, you've got the, the oracle, and then you've got the person who was coming in to meet the serpents in the center, okay. as it all manifested. Timing is everything, as is everything in Ireland. Timing is everything when you're dealing with manifestation. It's very interesting with the frequencies. I read uh, the article about the uh, about the burial mounts and the research in there, yeah, with the frequencies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also they discovered as well that that particular um, research team that came across, um, they also discovered that the frequencies of the stones, the standing stones, um, rose sharply at sunrise. And it reached for about two hours and then then dropped off quickly. And um, so there was something going on within the stones that they couldn't understand. We still can't understand what's going on with those particular stones. Um, I work primarily with these mounds rather than the stones themselves, the standing stones. Interesting. Man, we, that, um, Brandon and I, we, we've talked about frequencies um, a lot <laughs> when, when we met. And um, a little bit off topic maybe but referring to your post that i quoted a few minutes ago um and i know that you're not specif specifically addressing the issue of camouflage in your article but still first up i think it's all about frequency and at least this could be a good approach to the question of how they disguise themselves from us when we speak about ufos for example um the ability to make objects invisible using frequencies For, to me, is a fascinating concept, and it, and it uh, and its basis is the use of metamaterials in science. Mm. Quite interesting. Um, these artificially produced materials can manipulate light, mm -hmm. light waves, so that they are directed around an object instead of reflecting or refracting them. So this creates the impression that the object is invisible to the human eye. So it's a scientific approach, but. I like the idea a lot, and it's all about. Well, all, also, bear in mind what Brandon Brandon had touched on earlier. It actually may not be there at all. Yeah, uh, that's the trippiest thing to think that <laughs> all of it. By the way, that like your life maybe started in 1997, and everything before that's just a memory that you had, or even this morning, all the memories were implanted. China doesn't exist unless you're there. Just the idea of a place called China does. It's fascinating when you start really, really, really breaking down how perception managed you are to every degree in this reality, whatever this thing is. Oh, I think I would need a whiskey for that. <laughs> I mean, fat, fat donkey leg the smoke for that one. Absolutely, brother. I hear you. Definitely. Okay. But um, Brand Brandon, I said Brandon, Barry, we let you travel on now. I see your, your dog wants to go outside. He's yes. Like, yes. Uh -huh. She was here for a while now. Yeah. And that we, we, uh, Keep a few, a few questions for the next time and we are um, patiently waiting for your second book. Excellent. Thank yeah. you. We, Thank you very much. And have you back on 
when it's when it's out and, and when we've read it. So thank, thank you very much, folks, and and I really do pre I, I appreciate it, and I love the conversation very very um, um, out there, and, and and I loved it because it pushes me, uh, yeah. and uh, and I love that. That's that's your work, man. You you inspire us with just with your presence. The things that interest you are interesting. You're interesting. You know, it'd be it'd be horrible if you were boring. But thank God you're not. <laughs> I I would think Daniel would do that. But I it it's just awesome, man, to come together and really you inspire such great questions. And so thank you, honestly. Thank you, thank you. You're very kind. And Daniel, shoot me up anytime whenever you need it. I will. Thank you so much. All so, right, guys. Um, I will put links uh to Barry in the description to Barry's books. Do you want your uh, Facebook? Do you want people to, to find you on Facebook? And, and Sure, they can find me on Facebook. That's, that's entirely up to themselves. Okay, I will put all the necessary links in the description, guys. I will also put links of Brandon Thomas's podcast, Expanding Reality, in Might the description. Well. <laughs> okay, thank you, guys. <laughs> Bye.